So, Seamus, we're back at the diecast again. How you doing? I'm doing better than the last time we spoke. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. I listened to your other podcast. You're doing quite a few this week. You're going to start another few, and maybe you can have like a whole podcast empire by next week. Right. Well, podcast is actually pretty good in terms of hours invested to entertainment produced. Like, it's almost one-to-one, mm. -one, right? Yeah. Like, I sit here for an hour, and people get about an hour worth of entertainment. Where, you know, if I write a post, that's an entire afternoon to, like, write an article that you read in 10 minutes. Yeah. If you make a video, it's like a week's worth of time for 10 minutes. Right. Oh, yeah. Video is the worst. I can get a... When I'm really rolling, I can get a Colonel Detlef video which is like three to four minutes done in a day. Uh, but that's still like, yeah, way lower ratio than podcast. Right. Now, for the me, the podcast is a little more because I also have to write the post to go with it. And that means listening to it a second time. But even that, that's like two to one. You know, invest two hours, get one out of entertainment. That Even at that, that's still way better. You know, like an order of magnitude better than anything else. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of high-value entertainment, the Stanley Parable is back, apparently. So, I'm playing Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. I didn't even know this was coming out. I just saw it pa pop up in, you know, I launched Steam, and it was like, hey, here, we're having a sale on this stuff. I'm like, whoa. Um, I wondered, Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, is this just a deluxe version of the original game? You know, with like a couple <laughs> new endings. Because like, I don't need to buy the entire game just for a couple more endings. And I went back and forth on it. And I was like, uh, you know what? It's been long enough since I played the original that I wouldn't mind playing through it again. So I went ahead and bought it. And then it turns out that's what the game is about. <laughs> what? Like the first game was all about choices in video games. The... the the big irony of the of the original Stanley Parable is the the true ending where Stanley breaks free from the simulation and becomes f a free man and you know gets to walk outside is the one where you do exactly everything the narrator tells you to do. <laughs> yes. Okay, and so the whole like the whole thing is like this meditation on choice in video games and the narrator's always talking about a story he wants to tell you and he's always talking about the choices but you like hardly ever make any choices and he never tells you a sensible story <laughs> except for the what? one where you do exactly what you're told. Yeah. This game is the same thing where he starts off talking about how this is a new expanded version and then he's talking about how it's a sequel, and then they're going to have all these new features, and they're stupid, like, idiotic fe Okay, I'll give, I'll spoil one feature, just to give you an idea where it's coming from. He, the narrator decides, like, halfway through playing through the game again, it, you know, it's it feels exactly like the original game, right? You boot it up, same narration, same office. And you start playing it, and then the narrator's like, oh, oh, no, 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 you've seen all this, you've seen all this, let me show you the new content. And he takes you to this room where there's the jump circle, and it's a circle in the middle of the floor. And if you're standing inside the circle, you can use the jump button. <laughs> and of course, there's no reason to jump. There's no, like, gameplay benefit to jumping. You're in the middle of a room. It's not like you're jumping on anything or over anything. You're just allowed to hop in place. But not only that, there's a counter. And you have a limited number of jumps. <laughs> no. And they go across your entire save. And when you are done jumping, you are... D so you can only jump within this circle and only a certain number of times. <laughs> like, that's how, like, that's the new feature that he's bragging about, is this stupid, pointless thing. And there's a whole bunch of that. And he keeps trying to bring out new features and sell you on all this stuff that doesn't even work. And, you know, it's just, it's more nonsense. But in the same way that the first game was all about, well, what is choice in, in a story? This one is all about, like, well, what is a sequel anyway? And he keeps changing the name of the game in the menu. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> Highly recommend. Oh, cool. That sounds great.
So is this more like meditation on gameplay versus meditation on narrative? Or is it just like more poking fun at game tropes? It's, it's almost poking fun at game development now. It has this mm. thing, like he talks about, you, you can tell the narrator is just riding high on his 2013 game that was a hit and he doesn't know what to do next. So he's got this entire <laughs> hall of all the awards that the original Stanley Parable won. And then, you know, you go through that and you look at all of them, and then he's got all these ideas for the sequel, which you're playing, but he hasn't implemented yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's what it is. It's kind of about game development, and what do you do with a game, and, you know, what do people want from a sequel? And, of course, he asks you, and you can't say anything, and he asks, acts like you answered, and then he gives you something stupid anyway. Right. I just... I'm having a wonderful time. It is so, it, it's exactly what I need right now, which is a game that is amusing and not at all challenging. I am not up, you know, I am not in the, I'm not in a headspace where I could be playing like Doom Eternal or Factorio or a game that takes, you know, effort. I need, right. I need one of those games that's just enough gamey to not be a movie. It has some interaction, but nothing, no, no real challenging interaction. Right. Well, speaking of games that don't really have any real interaction and games that came out in the 20 teens and are still going somehow, uh, No Man's Sky has released a new <laughs> content patch. I saw the Outlaws um, trailer and um, I saw that you had to... St I No, I saw an LP. Somebody on YouTube was like, hey, let's play the Outlaws. And I'm like, oh, let's see the new content. And he starts off by saying, all right, if you want to do this content, you got to start a new save. Really? And I'm like, well, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe this person was an idiot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they're on YouTube, so who knows? Right. But they're like, you got to start a new save to do this content or whatever. And of course, you know, it's like, oh, well, let's see what the beginning of the game looks like. And, you know, it's, it's typical default starship. You've got three inventory slots. Your pockets are always full. Everything's broken. <laughs> and you spend two hours wandering around the planet before you can leave. And I'm like, wow, this new content is sure is, this is like the very worst part of No Man's Sky. <laughs> and they make you play through it again. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I bypassed all of that by playing only and exclusively in creative mode, which is not as free and and open as one might hope. But it at least prevents you from needing to like unbreak everything that the game generates and then breaks for you. Oh. So tell me about this night. I mean about this expansion. <laughs> yeah. So so that uh, No Man's Sky Outlaws is supposed to be like. There's now this whole underworld of, like, people who are fighting the man or the sentinels or something. And, and like, so it's all this whole criminal underworld vibe going. Um, so I popped in. Uh, so, so like, the, the main things that they have on their thing are, like, pirate underworld. Uh, there's a new class of ships called solar sail ships. And uh, then there's like whole outlaw systems, which are, quote, dangerous, lawless places with frequent conflict, unquote. Um, they've also added cargo inventories to your ship, I think. Another inventory screen. The worst yeah. part of the game. And they keep expanding it and making it more complicated. And just these thousands of in inventory screens and sub screens and sub pocket <laughs> dimensions to carry yeah, yeah. ever more, and and they they keep solving this problem while also making it worse. It's like, hey, the new update gives you ten new cargo slots, and also here's fifty new items to collect. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, well, so we'll we'll come back to that. Um, so there's like new cargo inventory and then also space combat has been completely overhauled for quote speed and excitement uh, And then they also added Shields to enemy starships. So now it takes longer to blow them up. I guess uh, So that <laughs> increases the speed, speed and excitement, and excitement. I hope and uh, and also pirates can now raid your settlements So you can be off exploring the galaxy and uh, your settlements can get blown up by pirates now. So that's exciting Wow what if creepers could just blow up your home in Minecraft while you were out mining? Wouldn't that just make the game so much better? 
so much better. What, Just like why Minecraft. didn't they think of? Why didn't they think of this? <laughs> so okay, so let's go back to to solar sail ships really quick because that's like a quick one um it's basically just like one of those tech slots that you can add to your ship and that adds like solar sails to your ship and that makes your drive more efficient i think but like all the things in no man's sky and in so many of these modern games that have like incremental improvements you can add these incremental improvements are so small that they're just not worth messing with like the solar shale yeah. sails on your ship make your drive like 12% more efficient. And it's like, uh, okay. Yeah. Will you like, even notice 12 that? 12% is not yeah. a lot, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, if it was 90% more efficient, and, like, it also made you move half as fast, it was like, okay, that would be an interesting trade-off. Like, do I want to get there faster? Or do I want to use more fuel? Like, there's an interesting trade-off there. But, no, it doesn't affect your, your speed at all. It doesn't affect anything except your fuel performance. So there's no downside. And that's another thing about so many things in No Man's Sky. is like, here's this thing. Do you want it? Of course you want it, because there's no downside. It's like a total bonus thing to your whatever it is. But the bonus is so small that then what you're really trading against is inventory slots. So let's talk about inventory slots. You've got your personal character inventory slot, which is your exosuit. And then you've got your ship inventory, which is the stuff you carry on your ship. And then you've got your... What? The, the ship... Oh, no. But, yeah, you're... But you're... Okay, so it's your your inventory and your ship inventory are like the two big things, except that right. your ship is actually broken down into the cargo inventory, the tech inventory, and the general inventory. And the tech inventory can only hold tech items, and the general inventory can hold anything, and then the cargo inventory can hold more of the kinds of things that you can hold in general inventory, but again, not like tons more. So like cargo inventory slots can carry twice as much i think as a normal slot yeah i think like twice as not, much not so much more <laughs> twice so or maybe five added... times it's not like 10 times yeah you know? yeah it's not a huge amount um so you can carry like and and then so they added cargo inventory to your exosuit now as well so now you've got on your exosuit you've got your normal inventory you've got your multi-tool inventory which is the stuff that you've added to your multi-tool and then which is kind of like the tech inventory on your ship and then you also have cargo inventory in your exosuit now. So now that's like two different screens with three different sub menus of inventories each. And then of course you can also have your capital ship and your capital ship has its own normal inventory and its own tech inventory and its own cargo inventory. Um, so that's great. And then if you want to transfer inventory items between your ship and your capital ship, you have to transfer them first to your exosuit and then you can transfer them to your capital ship, unless it's a tech item, yeah. which you can't transfer to your exosuit because you can't fit in your exosuit inventory slots. And oh my god, this is so so dumb. So like another you, thing, you, you I noticed, your two biggest inventories are your ship and your capital ships. But the only way to transfer stuff between them is to ferry them through your person, which is your smallest. Yeah, inventory. I think so. It, there's like a there's like a speed transfer if you've got the matter transporter or something. You can like right. speed send items from any inventory to your capital ship, and then you can install oh, one of your ships. Way. You can speed send it to your your, to your ship. Yeah, so you can't pull it in to your your personal inventory. It just goes out. So yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on. It's yeah. The flowchart of trying to explain to people how this works is absolutely horrendous. And this isn't. This it's, is yeah, just the bonkers. UI. This is UI. This is like <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. So, so then I was looking at, like, okay, what's the deal with these cargo inventory slots? Like, how much can they hold? And you'd think it'd be like, okay, it's like they can hold N number of stacks of items. Um, and like in Minecraft, to be fair, like, some items stack differently than other items. But unlike in Minecraft, the size of the stack depends on which inventory slot it is in. So, so there's, like, this whole matrix of, like, these different types of items can hold these different types of stack sizes and all these different sizes of inventories. And they're all so stupidly tiny, except for, like, in creative mode, you can hold, like, a thousand of basically everything. Um, but, like, all the other normal inventory systems are all, like, 
stupidly small stack sizes, especially when you're using like hundreds of these things for recharging your gun and recharging your suit and recharging your ship and recharging your landing legs and recharging your hyperdrive and that all these different things and like and the storage systems in your ship and your hyperdrive and your gun and all of those things are so small and then to on top of all that the stuff that you should be able to store a virtually infinite amount of have the smallest stack sizes like navigation data navigation data in the largest cargo slot for the like the largest item you can hold in your capital ship, right? One of these huge cargo bays, you can store 30, 30 navigation data items in that slot. It's like, <laughs> is this like a stack of reel to reel tape reader machines or something? Like, what are you storing this data on? Right. It's so, so dumb. So, and then it costs you like 400 million credits to upgrade your, your suit fully so that you can have all of these cargo slots that you can like shuttle things back and forth through manually like you're some sort of data management hard drive driver or something like there should just be a system that automates all of this away so you don't ever there, have to think about it there's that puzzle where it's like you you're you're on one side of a river with a wolf and a sheep or a wolf yes. and a chicken or whatever and you can, yeah yeah you got to solve how to get the things across one at a time, but some things can only go one way. That's No Man's Sky inventory all the time. It's just that yeah. puzzle over and over again. Oh, yeah. Well, and they've even added elements that are very much like that in pets, because now you can find an animal and you can, like, tame it, and then it can be your pet, and then you can summon it anywhere. Um, and then you can, like, bring it out and change its clothes or what i don't know i don't know what they're trying to do with this thing but it's like you've got pets and you can do stuff with them um so i got a pet and i went to some other world because that's what you do in no man's sky and then i was like okay i want to you know change my pet's hairstyle or whatever so i got a quest to do something and so i tried to bring my pet out and it's like oh this is the wrong environment for this pet you, this pet can't survive in this environment i was like what? no man's sky no man's sky how do i change my pet's thing if I don't have my pet out in the world, oh, well, it's not possible. You have to bring your pet out before you can do anything to it. And you can't bring it out here. That would kill it. What are you, some monster? I'm like, no, my sky. You're the monster. Well, I like how the, it pretends like it's this deep scientific simulation. Like it's trying to do this, this Kerbal Space Program kind of thing. Oh, no, the atmosphere is wrong and the pressure. It's like... None of this is simulated. Your, your your solar systems are three planets just sort of like hanging out together around a bright spot. Like there's <laughs> no And now you're gonna like hassle me about about the right environment. Like there's no gra there's no variation in gravity, has nothing to do with planet size. Um, atmospheric pressure has uh -huh. nothing to do with planet size. None of this is any basis in anything. None of the colors make sense. None of the landscapes make sense. It's all just random number generated arbitrary. And then it's like, oh no, that randomly generated animal can't live in this randomly generated planet. <laughs> it's like, get out of here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you think you're Carl Sagan? Shut the hell up, No Man's Sky. <laughs> exactly. A minute ago you couldn't see you couldn't stack 30 floppy disks with navigation data on them, and now you think you're Carl Sagan. <laughs> That's right. The mysteries of the universe. Oh man, and don't get me started on like the story. I I mistakenly, erroneously, and immediately regretted uh, engaging with the storyline for a bit and oh it's fool. all like oh oh here's the mysterious guy is gonna say something to you but you have to set up some transponders or something it's how i go around and set up the transponders oh, right and, and oh and he's like oh you're not alone in the universe i'm like man have you seen all the starships flying overhead Dude, oh, you, <laughs> you are not alone Oh my God, I met four different aliens, like, trying to get over here to set up a transponder to talk to you, and you're like, ooh, there might be other life out there. It's like, what? Wait, are you from some other game? Like, where, does, where is this coming from? I, I have no idea. So I, I disconnected from that as quickly as I could. 
Um, and then I was just like roaming around because I'm in creative mode, so I don't have to worry about refueling my hyper drive or whatever. So I'm just roaming around looking at stuff and I find some like upgrades for my multi tool or it was my life support. I find a life grade support multi tool thing and it's like, okay, well, it gives you 10% more life support. And I was like, 10%? Is that a lot? Is that a little? Like, how much life support do I have? So I go look it up because I'm in creative mode. So, like, I never run out of life support. It's great. And it turns out, like, in the normal game, you've got about 12 minutes of life support, which is complete bullshit. Like, if I, if in real life, I want to go somewhere where there is no breathable atmosphere at all and I need complete oxygen supply respiratory system support, like, oxygen tank scuba mask kind of thing. A tank will last you for like two hours and and then you right. have to refill it. But like that's two hours of, and that's normal everyday technology I can buy right now. I can go down to Walmart and get one of those. So there's no reason why you can only have 12 minutes of life support in your exosuit and your super fancy and it's got like huge amounts of spatial compression stuff. Like, I can store all this stuff to build an entire base inside my suit. Does it make any sense? No, it doesn't make any it, sense. It, but, it, like, it, it gets even weirder. That, it gets yeah. even weirder because um, that's basically your movement energy. If you use your jetpack a lot or sprint a lot, that goes down faster. What? It's like burning your life support to run your engine? I guess. Am I a robot? So dumb. Is it my battery? And, and is this like, just a battery? Yeah, it's you, there should be a tank. Like, it, your inventory is like this grid of squares. And it's like, okay, old-timey, like, adventure games used to do that because they didn't know any other way. But, like, why don't I have a life support tank that I put stuff in that and that can hold, like, you know, two hours of life support juice or whatever? Like, it's not like I'm shoveling like shovelfuls of hydrogen or whatever into my backpack like how does this actually work this does this is not representing something that actually makes any sense and like there are no pipes there are no pipes in no man's sky like people have invented ways to like move things to other things and hook up you know normal operations they've got a quick give like a quick charge menu so you can press a key and quickly easily charge your systems like i don't want to do this i a scuba tank has a tube and it's connected to my face. I don't ever have to quick charge anything. It just works until it's out. Right. It's got a gauge on it. Oh, man. Man. No man. Sky. What even are you trying to do? So I start up the game for the first time. It takes a full minute. I timed it 60 seconds for it to start up. There's no reason why it needs to do that. And that's just to get to the main menu. After you get there, then you have to like actually load the game, which takes another, I don't know, 15 or 20 seconds. Just right just terrible um so okay so i it, upgrade so i got this upgrade for my life support it's like 10 percent. it's like okay well that's nothing that's stupid so then i'm roaming around and i find an extremely powerful upgrade there's like class c which are the worst and then b and then a and then s and then x for outlaw or something and and like oh, i found really? an I s1 or was something x. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now there's, there's the other world, and there are illegal upgrades you can get, which are actually not that super great. They're they're on they're on par right. with like the S class or whatever. But I found this one, and it's it's quote extremely powerful unquote, and it makes the guns on my spaceship like one percent faster, and like use six percent less heat or something. It's just like really really disappointingly poor. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is the extremely powerful. I think I found one that made my life support like twice last twice as long, like two times life support or something. I was like, okay, like that doesn't seem extremely powerful to me, but fine, right, whatever. That seems like that would that seems like that would be a good tier two. Oh, okay, I I'm guess. gonna upgrade to the one. You know, that would be good tier two, and then tier three would be twice that, and then the, the S rank would be eh, functionally unlimited, you know, re refill it once per game session kind of logic. Right, right. Yeah, and... But no. And, like, every space station should have, a, a like, a refuel port where you go and just, like, whenever you walk through the door, it's like... Psh, refills all your stuff now you're topped off tops you like, off yeah yeah like and there's nobody that sells this you have to go on the international galactic exchange it's like if it's like if you wanted to refuel your car you had to go down to the stock exchange and like buy stocks in in fuel futures or something 
in order and then have them delivered so you could refuel your car like it's just no it's no one would do that you can't even buy ship fuel directly you have to buy ingredients and mix it yourself <laughs> right. it's like is this illegal what am i doing here is this am i running an illegal lab of some kind speaking of illegal things there are illegal items now and and uh they talk about like oh you know you got to be careful in the pirate systems because the the sentinels won't be patrolling and keeping you safe and like first off i never saw any sentinels anywhere in my playthrough which makes me think that they're part of like the difficulty of the game um and maybe they just don't show up in in creative mode so maybe i missed out on that but uh that like, that wasn't even a thing so then like the pirate stuff was also not a thing because like okay well i can carry these illegal things everywhere and nobody's gonna scan me because there's no sentinels anywhere so like right. what's the point what's the point of them being illegal if no one's enforcing this what i also ran into a thing and this may have been just a problem in linux because i'm running in linux and it, no man's sky isn't native to linux um but I got a quest to take a screenshot in game of a certain thing like go to a place and like take a screenshot of whatever this animal or this thing or something i forget what it was and um but whenever i would take any screenshot of any kind it would crash the game like hard crashed back to, oh. <laughs> back to desktop so um i couldn't do that so I, no screenshot quest for me now like i said that might have just been because i'm running it in you know steam support linux version but um Still not great, right? Like everything else worked. So it, why do screenshots not work? That seems like something that should be easy. And it probably has to do something with like system path. It's trying to send it to my Windows home folder or something. And Linux is like, home folder? I, that doesn't exist. And so then it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. Sabuku! So, but all that said, I had a good time. I played it for several game sessions, each of several hours long. And uh, yeah, it was... It's cool. You fly around and I found a moon that's all hexagons and like all the animals are hexagons and all the plants are like made of hexagons. It was kind of cool. And it was like, wow, it's a theme planet. And you made some friends and built a little base. And I mean, until they started telling me, you need an overseer for your base. And I was like, nope, I'm going to do something else after that. But uh, right. yeah, it was, you know, it was a generally good time. So creative mode. Yeah, I, I had a I had a good time for a few hours. Well, that's more than that's more than I can say for most of my sessions with the game. Yeah. Every time I every time I sit down to the game, I keep hoping for the game I wanted, and of course it's never going to be that, but it's the only thing like this out there. <sighs> so, how about something that's not disappointing? I watched yeah. The Batman this week. Um, I touched on this in my podcast that I did with Chris and Steve. Mm -hmm. But I'll just repeat what I said there. Um, I like, I, I prefer the heroic, noble, do-gooder Batman. Like Batman of the Adam animated series. Saves everybody, tells the truth, does the right thing. Doesn't hurt people more than he needs to. Doesn't take joy in hurting people. Um, just wants to protect the city. A protector. And a detective. Yeah, and he, kind of like a 1930s stand-up uh, gentleman Batman. Yes, that's that's the, my favorite. Um, and almost nobody wants to do that Batman. That's too boring. He's just a hero. What we want is messed up, psychologically damaged, morally compromised, um, you know, horribly flawed anti-heroes that's what we want <laughs> we want Rorschachs we want we and so every time they when they adapt Batman they almost always they're either adapting Batman at the end of his career after Robin's been horribly killed and he's old and bitter and looking to die or they do the young incompetent Batman when he's a rage monster and doesn't have control over his emotions and just wants to beat everybody up and he's a dumb thug like those are the stories everybody wants to take to tell and and then you're like hey you know they're not doing Batman right and everybody's like you don't understand Seamus this is Batman at the beginning of his career this is Batman at the end of his career and it's like I know that's that's the problem is that you know the 
the there's the canonical version of Batman, which we can imagine he was for 95% of his career. But everybody wants to tell stories about the other 5% of the career at the beginning and the end when he was a jerk. Well, when and they can heroic. justify portraying him as a jerk, at least. Because, like, right. Batman's not real. Right. And so that really rubs me the wrong way. And they get tired of that. I just want to see a hero. But having said that, I kind of dig this Batman anyway. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot that I liked about it. Now, he's young, but he's not, and he's a little grouchy, you know, and he's, he's not a super great detective yet, but he does solve, <laughs> mis he does solve stuff. Like, there are riddles, and he is the person that solves the riddles. And everybody else is like, oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Just like Jon Snow, he does know some things. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, Batman, I really... it's This isn't bad. For an early Batman, this one isn't too much of a dull thug. And he's not too horrible of a detective. And the other thing I really, really appreciated about this movie was Gotham. Um, the Christian Bale Batman movies were just like, Gotham was just like a normal Western city, right? It felt like anything. Like, Gotham felt like Vancouver. It just, there's nothing special. It's just glass towers. You never got the feeling that this city needed him. And let's say it looks like it's doing all right. Yeah, it's very modern. Right. I always loved the I, there's near where I used to live in Southern California. There was a Six Flags, and at the Six Flags, they had a whole Gotham-themed area, and it was all pipes and radioactive waste and broken-down machinery and like you know the bad parts of Chicago mixed with the bad parts of Shanghai. Just like this yeah. really gritty, nasty, mechanically infested sewer kind of place. Right, and. The Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher Batman movies went too far. Like they were live action, but their but their Gotham was like cartoonish, like almost <laughs> whimsical. Like it didn't fit. Yeah, I'll never forget. I think it was Batman and Robin. Like there was just this bridge that had these giant, like size of the Statue of Liberty statues on either end holding up the, the bridge. Like, <laughs> this would be the most remarkable bridge in the world if it really existed. They were so enormous that, like, Batman and Robin were driving down one of the arms and they had an entire argument while driving down the arms <laughs> at breakneck speed. <laughs> it's like a Calvin and Hobbes down, sled down the hill kind of thing. Yes! Exactly. They're like, like the motion blur in the background. They are going so fast, having an argument over whether or not it's too dangerous for Robin to attempt to jump off the end of this arm. And Batman, <laughs> to keep Robin safe, like turns off Robin's motorcycle <laughs> so that he stalls at the end of the arm instead of being able to jump off the hand. <laughs> Lovely. But it's that I, I kind just, of over-the-top, bombastic, art deco kind of thing that it was missing from the modern movies. Right, but it was almost, it was turned up too much. Like, that works in the cartoon, but it's like, it doesn't fit with live action. It looks too ridiculous in live action. But this movie, The Batman, boy, it just sort of nailed perfectly this dirty city that seems to be entirely waterfront, you know the docks and the industrial yeah. district and these twisty like cobblestone streets um that the twist around all over the place nothing feels like nothing feels like a modern city it almost has this weird like some of the intersections might feel a little european with how tight they are mm sure you know how narrow and crooked it's like, like the, as if the worst of of overbuilt in European cities mixed with the worst of over-industrialized American cities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, oh, I loved the look of it, and it just felt dirty, and it felt like, okay, this is a city that definitely needs a superhero helping it. 
Like, this is a city <laughs> that needs a superhero and not just, you know, a better public works program. <laughs> like, like, the, uh, like, some of the versions of Gotham, it's like, these guys don't need Batman. They just need the Department of Transportation to get on the ball with these potholes. <laughs> right? But this nice. city... Yeah, this city needs Batman, and uh, I appreciated that too. It was sort of, it was sort of um, almost comically emo. Like at one point, it plays some Nirvana, like classic Ooh. Nir Nirvana. Like wow, the, he, um, you know, and he's got his, he's got his mane of emo hair and his eye makeup. This is Batman wearing eye makeup and his emo hair and his frowny face. And it, it was just <laughs> on the side of fun. If they pushed it a little too far, it, a little bit further, it would have been comical. But they managed to so, keep it just on the side of fun. So they got as close as they could with live action to the Lego movie Batman. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the best we could have hoped for. Yeah, I really like this movie in style. The movie doesn't hold up when you think about it. Like, there's a whole chase sequence where Batman chases the penguin. And, I mean, this is like one of these chase scenes that ends in a giant, you know, a truck jackknifes and explodes and probably kills 10 people. Oh, and I thought it was going to be, like, shot in, like, the penguin waddling slowly down the road. Batman driving super fast in his bat car. Penguin waddling. Batman driving. And then like <laughs> no, no. they act as if that's a chase. No, no. Batman or er, penguins running away in a conventional car, and Batman's in his big souped-up muscle car. But penguin keeps creating problems for him, right? And eventually, pre penguin causes a crash. Okay. But it's like what? It was a cool chase scene. But then you think. Why did you bother Batman? This is Penguin. He he runs this important business in town. You know where he's gonna be tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. He's not gonna he's not gonna leave town. Just like show up at his place of work and wait for him. <laughs> you know when he works. I mean you know where he you know everything about this guy. Why would you chase him across the city? And I, I don't even th I don't even remember what Batman I mean Batman caught him but I don't know like he didn't go to jail after that I don't think he was even trying to put him in jail like what was the point of even chasing him I don't even remember <laughs> he wanted to say I'm the Batman anyway I liked it it was a fun movie and um, if you're gonna make dark and brooding Batman. I guess get the art team involved in it. Don't make dark and brooding Batman and then have him protecting Vancouver because it just doesn't work. Yeah, I, cool. I, I can't have to, have to look into Vancouver it. needs me. <laughs> They're hotboxing again. Well, speaking of chases, um, I played Hyper Rogue, which is a, a game that takes place in a hyperbolic geometry similar to um, Hyperbolica. Oh, man, we got two hyperbolic games this year? Well, I think Hyper Rogue is old. I'm not sure how like how long it's been around, but it's in Linux, and so it's probably developed in, like 10 years ago. Anyway, it's, it's very interesting because when you're running away from stuff in, oh, in a normal grid game... Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Same time as No Man's Sky. Come on, get on the ball, No Man's Sky. Uh, so, so in a normal game, like in a grid, when you're running away from guys in... like This is a top-down roguelike kind of thing. Um, when you're running away from guys in a normal grid-based roguelike, uh, they can just like move the same speed as you, and like in whatever direction you're going, they'll just move in the same direction, and they'll always keep up with you. You can't ever really get away from them. But in Hyper Rogue, because it's a hyperbolic geometry, any direction that you're going is further away from the people behind you than it is from you, in, weirdly. And so the the best they can do to keep up with you is to get right behind you, which means getting in a line. And so when you run away from things in Hyper Rogue, they naturally line up in a line and then you can fight them one on one. And the, the mechanics of Hyper Rogue are one hit, one kill. Like if they hit you, you die. And if you hit them, they die. And uh, and so it's this really interesting thing where it plays with like the geometry of the world itself to get you. So then you're always looking for escape routes and like, OK, well, if I can, you know, run like 15 squares in this direction, then all the guys will get lined up and then I can pop them all down. And then 
there are all these different zones where there are different mechanics that like the enemies work in different ways or they have different powers it was just it's very interesting i haven't i haven't beat it or or even exhausted all the the different levels yet but um i was having a real fun time with it so hyper rogue uh give it a look it's probably on Ishio. i i have no idea but it's on linux at least it's on it's on steam there you go for what yeah 12 bucks 10 perfect it's a good old time check it out uh, I also played Dwarf Romantic again. They released the the 1.0 version of Dwarf Romantic and uh, same old game, it's more polished. It's also very fun, very nice for. Uh, they added some some different game modes. One of them is like quick mode or something, and you have a limited number of tiles. Like no matter how well you do, you only have this many tiles, and so it only takes like 15 minutes or whatever, which is great because then you can like oh, I want to play some Dwarf Romantic quick mode, go, and you just like do it, and it's like oh you're done, and now you can go do something else. And uh, they've got a bunch of different game modes, I won't describe them all, but Dwarf Romantic, real fun. Version 1.0 is out now, so if you're averse to early access games, but you want to check it out, it's out of early access now. I have this urge to make a version of... I, I want to make a program to play Dwarf Romantic. <laughs> have it play itself? Well, just because once the map gets really big, it becomes a search problem. Like, yeah, yeah I can throw this down and this water will touch this water, but... Maybe somewhere, somewhere on this map is a perfect match, but I don't have time to like scan the entire map for it. That would take forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you often get sort of tunnel vision where you're working in one area and you kind of forget about, you know, because you you know, especially if you end up with a map that is not a circle, you know, you end up building a big strip, let's say. Like it's really long north south, but short east to west. Then yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of surface area. Right, and it's kind of annoying to scroll between the two extreme ends of your your domain there. So you kind of like end up focusing just on the stuff that's in front of you at any given moment. And so I kind of want to make like a program that would play it and like, well, what's possible and how often can you get perfect matches and what what different um strategies you know is it better to go for matches you know how compact can you build and if you just insisted on perfect matches everywhere you're not willing to have imperfect you know edges yeah. non matching edges and you know what if you want to don't care about how big it gets and you just want to keep going as long as possible what different strategies work best i would love to like interrogate that but there's, there's no good way to do that. I mean, you could make your own version of the game, but it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be like this version. Yeah. yeah I also wonder how much the game uh, fiddles with the random tile generation in order to either match what you already have or to not match what you have. And I don't know if it does or not. Oh, but yeah. It would be interesting to know if it does. And, uh, you know, how it spaces stuff out, if it's truly random or if there's some sort of like it's putting tiles in and then drawing tiles out of a bag somehow or, you know, putting them in a deck of cards kind of thing. Uh, if it's right. generated or not, or I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what yeah. they're doing behind the scenes. If it's like, OK, you have to get at least one railway every 20 tiles or something. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes you're waiting for something and you're like, should I be waiting for this? Does the game know I'm waiting for this? Like, is there a way to tell the game that I want this? So, yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be cool to, to make your own version of the game and, like, include a bunch of automation options to be like, you know, show me anytime there's a perfect match, like, just show me where it is or whatever. But, yeah, right. yeah dwarf matic is very interesting. It's a lovely little waveform collapse game. It's, it's, it is kind of like um, Sudoku in a way, where it, you're trying to, like fit yeah. these things in it's not quite as complete but it's like you know you're trying to trying to collapse this set of options into a thing where all the pieces fit together properly it would be interesting if it was actually like that where it creates an ideal map breaks it all up into tiles shuffles them and puts them in the bag oh so yeah like, if it was so you possible gotta figure to, out yeah to get a perfect game every time right and like it guarantees that you could have a perfect game yeah, that would be fast. Like, it's it starts off a giant circular island, say, and it peels them off and puts them in a bag in in order, like, starting in the middle or whatever, so that you could, 
do the reverse, and if you think about where you put them and make sure all the edges match perfectly, you'd have a chance at making, at recreating the original. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Anyway, a bunch of some fun stuff we could we could do with that. That would be fun to just do a whole diecast about like tile placing games. You've done a few uh, randomly generated tile tile generation map stuff, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh man. All right. So anyway, so I also played the Universe Sim. The Universe Sim. One word is Universe Sim, and it's like a god game kind of thing. It feels a little bit like black and white. It feels a little bit like Sim City. Um, it's got some, you know, some of those builder game vibes to it. The the thing I love yeah, I've got about this it, on my wish list, but I yeah, never, it was on sale this last it. weekend. Oh, I missed it. I picked it up. I mean, it was only twenty percent off, so it is not a huge deal. But I um I picked it up, played it. The thing I love about it, uh, right off the top, I mean, there's a lot of good things about it, but sticks out to me is that you um progressively unlock automation tools that handle tasks that you've already mastered. So like you'll be placing down um, water pumps and like uh, water reservoirs for your guys to go get drinks. And then as you're playing the game, you can unlock, you get to, you don't have to, but you can unlock like the water minister. And so then you assign one of your guys to be the water minister. And then he just like places down pumps whenever you need them and places down reservoirs wherever you need them. And he doesn't do a super great job, but you don't ever have to worry about it again. It's just like it takes care of that for you. And, uh, and it does that with a ton of the systems where you're like placing down engineering stations to maintain your buildings and then you can get a minister of engineering. He'll just like do that for you and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's very cool where it it allows you to focus on the thing you're doing right now. And then once you've done it for a while, it opens up the option to automate it. And uh, it feels like a nice balance between having just a button that you press that says play the game for me and having to do everything yourself like in factorio or or satisfactory right it also pre-generates a road network like it's got a road it's not a grid but it's like a road network thing that it generates over the whole planet but it doesn't get populated until you have buildings next to it and when you place a building you can decide to honor the road network or not honor the road network you can just place your buildings right on top of the roads and then they those roads won't get built um, or you can, you know, place them so that they line up with the roads and then there'll be roads there and then you can, you guys can get there faster. So it, it was this really cool kind of middle ground between having to put roads down all the time, which is a real pain, um, and not having any say in where your buildings are placed. They're just like placed on a grid or whatever. So this is like free placement of buildings, but also there's a road network, but you don't have to build the roads. They get built themselves. Also, the guys build all their own houses just like you don't ever have to build houses for you guys. So whenever there's more guys, they just build more houses. And it, yeah. It, so it's, there's some very cool automation stuff that's going on in there. And uh, I've been having a fun time with it. I haven't got to the end of that yet, but I'll report on it when I do. Awesome. Oh, yeah, this... I can't, I can't say I regret my Stanley Parable decision. You know what? It, I Getting Stanley Parable was the right thing to do right now, but this does look, really look fun. <laughs> I think this is the next thing on my list. Well, do we have time for some mailbags? Yeah, we do. Dear Diecast, I mean, hi. <laughs> I noticed that I tend to have an adversarial relationship with games, meaning that I usually put a higher difficulty for some reason, and when the game gives an unfair challenge, I get, oh, you want to play unfair? All right, I'll play unfair too, and start cooking up exploits or some cheap tactics within the game's rule set so that it'll become a battle of who can out-cheat the other. And at this point, it's two bitter rivals. So... What's your relationship with games tend to be? Best regards, Deadly Dark. Thank you, Deadly Dark. Um, well, uh, it depends on the game. Like, with No Man's Sky, I have this terrible abusive relationship. Because I keep <laughs> wanting... I keep... I'm like the battered housewife that keeps thinking No Man's Sky is going to change. No, he just came out with an update and he promised me he's done with the inventory nonsense. He swore <laughs> off... He swore off. He, he's done. He's going to go. He's going clean now. He's going to have real gameplay systems. And then you get in there, and it's a new inventory screen, and some new bullshit to collect. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he's never going to change. Oh man. So I guess it depends. I I get stressed when a game asks me what um what difficulty I want. I like to pick normal, um, but often, like, I'm always like, well, what do you mean by normal? 
<laughs> yeah. Like, you know, there it's the it's the classic problem. Oh man, that game was that game was brutal. I died like five times on every level, and somebody else was like, "That game was easy. I never died more than like five times on any level." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, just finished my Elden Ring run. This is it's, it's a cakewalk. Right, right. I do hear people talking about Elden Ring. Yeah, this was a pretty tough fight. It took me, um, it, it wasn't too bad. Once I figured out the strategy, I got him after like 20 tries. And I'm like, I would be so <laughs> tilted I'd have a stroke by like attempt six. <laughs> like, yeah. there would just be, I would just be unable to think straight. Um, yeah. So I tend to go. Game is, I tend to go yeah. the opposite order of Deadly Dark. Uh, Deadly Dark is like I'm going to set it up as high as I can and then get angry at the game when it doesn't give me, you know, a fair chance. Um, and I usually set it down pretty low. I'll set it to pretty easy, and then I'm kind of daring the game to give me a hard time. Right? It's like I set it to easy. It, this had better be easy, right? And and if I'm having right. a good time, maybe I'll set the difficulty higher and you know engage with the systems once I know what the systems are and you know get a feel for it. Um, but if the game doesn't play fair on easy mode, I am out. You know, that's that's another good point. Is if on the rare occasions when I play like a pop-up shooter, you know, a, a cover-based shooter, it's pretty common for me to like throw those on easy mode because they're just so boring and putting them on <laughs> yeah. harder difficulties just is like, oh, it's the exact same gameplay but now everything takes 10 times longer. Yeah. Yeah, is this is this difficulty slider the size of the bullet sponge, or is this like the <laughs> right. power of my weapons, or like the speed of combat? What what am I adjusting here? Right. Uh, but then again, if it's something that I really like, then I'm not going to put it on easy. You know, if it's a like if it's a, a an immersive sim, no. In fact, I might even bump it up if they've got like some some ultra simulation mode i might throw it up on you know yeah give me the extra challenges where you've got to take uh i really liked in in prey where you could have injuries that weren't just magically cured by a med pack like you had to get oh you had to get something specifically to knit bone or to close a wound or whatever i actually like that mm. the extra layer of of sort of resource management and planning and caution just to just to encourage me to not go into every fight guns blazing to make to make combat sort of expensive and painful yeah i think probably the best is where the game doesn't have a difficulty mode and it lets you decide what difficulty you want like with the batman arkham games where like you can just go in there and you know get knocked over a bunch if you want and that's fine you'll beat the game but if you want to like go zero hits you know, zero armor kind of run, you can do that too, and the game will reward you for it. But oh, it's not yeah. really a game mode so much as just a play style. Right. Oh, I'm not, you know what? I'm not going to put any points into art. That, that's true. On Batman, instead of turning up the difficulty, I started doing runs where I wouldn't invest in armor. Um, and instead I put it into the more fun powers and, you know, oh, give me more of this ability or whatever. So it was just um, even more of a glass cannon. And yeah, yeah, that actually is my favorite. And it's like, oh, if you're struggling, yeah, throw some extra, sp spend a few level ups on durability and survivability. If you're that bad at the game, you're probably not using all the extra fancy powers to begin with. You probably need to practice the basics. So that's a good yeah. place to spend your skill points is just on survivability. Yeah, that happens to me all the time when I'm starting a new game and I don't know the systems and the controls and stuff. And it gives me an option of like, what do you want for your level up thing? And I always choose the passive ability or the thing that I don't have to think about because it's like, I'm going to forget the third grenade. Like, I don't even use grenades at all, right? I don't need an extra one of those. I'm going to forget to yeah. use it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the th my tertiary grenades. I'm never going to remember to use that. So, like, why invest in that? But then once oh, you yeah. really you once you really get into the game and you discover, oh, that grenade is really good as an opener if one of these really annoying enemies is in the fight. And like that's something you discover after a while. So yeah. you know what so don't invest in that skill until you like realize it's important.
Just spend just yeah. spend points on more armor until you know what you're doing. <laughs> Because that's basically the difficulty selection, right? Like, as you're playing the game, you're deciding what kind of difficulty you want. And it's not just a slider that you don't know what it means. It's the mechanics that you're selecting that you've been playing with that you understand now. So that's like, that's the best difficulty, I think. Yeah. And so in that sense, I guess Elden Ring does have difficulty modes. Do you have time for one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Dear Diecast, I hope this early spring finds you in good humor. Ah. We got to it in time. I recently started my umpteenth playthrough of Neverwinter Nights 2 and noticed that I've gained a new habit and lost an old habit. Like most of us do in our daily life, I've started to close doors behind me in the game. There's no particular purpose for it, I just found myself doing so. I've also stopped rifling through cupboards, desks, and so on for small change, like the average video game protagonist. Do you guys have any habits that you brought to video games from real life, like closing doors or keeping things organized? And do you usually rifle through drawers and closets for random loot in real life? Wishing you all the best, Vale Tim. Huh. You know, it's been a while since I played a game where where it was an option. Like, I think it's been since Skyrim, where rifling through everything is an option. Like, in Prey, you're expected to absolutely <laughs> strip, the, strip the room down. You know, every check every cupboard for every resource and in doom you are not expected to do that and in fact you can't there is no searching cupboards gameplay in doom <laughs> right so so games have either like you've got to do it or you can't do it and that sort of optional thing isn't present in many games that i play these days um i do remember being obsessive like Filling up my inventory with low-value crap and then being frustrated that I can't unload like I, I want to sell all these You know busted doorknobs. I'm carrying around for absolutely no reason <laughs> Right like I got the four suitcases full of just random crap knickknacks and bric-a-brac um, that I've swiped from around the game world and I want to sell all this stuff but I need to find a shopkeeper so I can unload it and get my three gold yeah and um, yeah it's there just aren't that many games that do that anymore I that might change this year with um Starfield when Starfield comes out yeah we'll might see be time to might be time to 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 start ransacking rooms once again. We'll see what Starfield does. <laughs> I know I ransack rooms in real life looking for things and kids walk off with something. I'm opening all the drawers, looking under all the carpets. Oh, you live with you live with multiple children. Your life is chaos. You put an object <laughs> yeah, down, madness. you're gone for five minutes, and there is no telling where that object is when you come back. It, you come back, you you leave a an object that is not a toy. It is of absolutely no interest to any child. It is a boring, it is not colorful, it's made of metal, it's ugly, it's a tool, it's real expensive, and you put it down on a desk for five minutes while you answer the phone. And when you come back, it's gone, and you don't know where it is. It could be in a toy box. Maybe one of your kids ate it. Maybe it's in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> Maybe the dog has it. Maybe it's, it's in somebody's true. playpen. Maybe somebody's running around with it in their diaper. You don't know. Well, I love it when they'll go into drawers, take things out of the drawer, play with it for a little bit, forget what drawer they got it out of, put it away, but in a different drawer. Oh, no! <laughs> so the contents of the drawer is like, I organize my stuff, and they just slowly start migrating around and getting mixed up. <laughs> it's, like, it's like living with a poltergeist. Oh, man, I need... I need a teaspoon. I'm going to have this cup of tea. I need a teaspoon. Check this drill. Oh, oh, that's where my cordless drill went. Yeah. <laughs> the worst is when, of course, they get left outside in the rain, right? Like, something yeah. disappears. You're like, hey, where did the thing go? And they're like, I don't know where the thing is. Nobody knows. And then, like, six months later, you find it out in the gravel somewhere in a flower bed. And it's all rusty and ruined. Just like, okay, great. I guess I'm buying a new one of these. I mean, you already bought a new one, but... You know, right? It would have been nice. All right, let's live dangerously and do one more. Okay. Hi, Diecast. Do you recall some bugs and glitches that were so funny slash awesome that they made the game better for you? Cheers, Derek. Thanks, Derek. We'll try. Oh man, 
bugs that made the game better? I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm not one of those people that love... Like, some people thought that um, the constant bugs and wackiness in Skyrim was part of the charm. Haha, -ha, this monster hit me and, you know, smacked me away at orbital velocity, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not as charmed by that stuff, so I'm usually annoyed by bugs. So it's pretty rare for me to find one that I think is charming or interesting. Hmm, yeah. I, I think there's a question for, like, wacky, fun time, glitched game streamers or something, right? Like, there, there's a kind of person who just likes to encounter goofy, unexpected nonsense. And, like, I don't know, for me, like, I'm more interested in, like, systems that work and are comprehensible. So bugs are usually right. not a bonus. I guess there, there's that time, I don't know if it's still the case, but for a while in Satisfactory, when you went into the transit tubes, um, the rigging for your character's skeleton, so first off, you're usually in first person, so you don't see yourself, but when you go in a transit tube, you're in third person. And then if you were wearing the Blade Runners, um, your skeleton transformation didn't get applied to the Blade Runners properly, so they were just like standing upright in place. And then the rest of you was flying through the tube. So that was pretty funny. Pretty harmless. I don't know if it made the game better, but it was, it, I got a chuckle. Uh, yeah, the, the, the only time I enjoy bugs is when somebody else is fine. If you've ever watched the spiffing Brit oh, yes. on YouTube, um, where he finds exploits and breaks games... That's fun to watch. It's not fun to do yourself because it's just like, oh, it's like, oh, I have infinite money or infinite health or whatever. But it's funny to watch somebody else do it. And my favorite is still to this day where he played Prison Architect. And it, it's not really a bug. It was just an oversight in the design that the game pays you money when you clear trees. And you can plant trees. So he goes uh -huh. to build a prison... And instead of building a prison, he just starts a tree farm and never gets around to building a prison and just makes all this money. It never occurred to the developers, what if you plant trees, wait three days, harvest the trees, plant trees, and just keep selling all this wood? Like they thought you would do this once and the you know selling the wood would give you some money to start your prison. And instead, you can just keep growing more and more wood and make more money doing that than you could running a prison. And that's hilarious. <laughs> that is pretty good. A tree farm, like a tree farm simulator. Now, if you could find a game where, where you're supposed to have a tree farm and instead use that game to build a prison, that would be even better. Whoa. I feel like, Derek, if you're looking for this kind of content, this, you know, glitches that are make the game more enjoyable, I recommend watching the Watch Plus Play. It's the Watch and then the Plus Symbol Play by Loading Ready Live on YouTube or, or wherever you can get the Loading Ready Live. Um, and they just, like, go through a ton of bad games that are only interesting because they're so poorly made and glitchy. And so uh, that... That could be where you get your fix on this. All right. I feel like we've done a show. We have. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And everyone who's sending questions, thank you. We do have questions backed up. But if you would like to add more to the pile, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. There is also a image at the top of this post where you can see the email if you can't remember what I just said. And if you'd like to be back next week to hear how Seamus is doing and where I have wasted my time playing video games, we'd be happy to have you. Say goodbye, Seamus. Goodbye, Seamus. <laughs>